leaders and to get them committed actively to his church to help people grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior so they can increasingly know and do his will to work for the unity of all believers, engage in the common task of building God's kingdom. Baptism is a powerful, powerful testimony of personal faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, many countries, Muslim countries, for example, and, and uh, India and other places like that, if you make a profession of faith in Christ, uh, they say, well, that's good, and pat you on the shoulder, and there you go. But when you're baptized, your relatives who are of a different religion will turn your picture to the wall and have nothing to do with you. So it's a very strong testimony. <clears throat> it's also identification with the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism. I use the illustration of a wedding ring, which identifies a person as married. And this ring identifies me as married to Catholic. doesn't make me married, but it is an identification. In addition, it is a picture. And when Cora Allen comes down into the water and goes down under the water, it's a picture of her uh, death to sin, and she's raised in newness of life. And that's the picture. So, Coral, will you come and join me at this time? That's okay. Cora, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Yes. And do you purpose to live a life in obedience to Him and follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. And upon the profession of your faith and in obedience to His command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. A wonderful opportunity for us to share in this very special occasion, and at this time, Barbara has our announcement. Our announcements are on the back of the bulletin. Yoga classes are on Tuesday. Son of Man had risen from the dead. 
So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how it is written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I say to you that Elijah has also come. And they did to him whatever they wished as it was written of him. When he had come to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, they greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought my son to you who has a mute spirit. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes with his teeth and becomes rigid. But I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he, had saw, when he saw him, <clears throat> immediately the spirit convulsed him, and the boy fell down to the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he, Jesus, asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the waters and destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus saw that the people came running together. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out, convulsing him greatly, and came out of him. He became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. And Jesus took him up by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. When he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And God had his blessing to the reading of his word. <laughs> Christians and spending some time with believers in Mexico, some of whom were persecuted. And on our way back, I remember uh, we were coming across flat land, so it wasn't a physical mountaintop, 
but the sun coming up as we were driving to the east, heading back toward Alabama in our college days, and it was a mountaintop experience. Maybe you've had one of those as well. What we have before us in our scripture text this morning is the original mountaintop experience. You say, well, didn't Moses have a mountaintop experience in Mount Sinai? Yes, he did. And Elijah had a mountaintop experience when he defeated the 450 prophets of Baal. Yes, he did. But the reality is, this is what we might call the ultimate mountaintop experience because this was incredibly dramatic as these men experienced God on the mountain. Someone asked me, why didn't I preach this passage last week instead of our Mother's Day message? And I said, because there are five men on this mountain, none of whom was a mother. So I know it's not politically correct anymore to say mother or father or those kinds of things in the world we live in today. The scripture doesn't put up with that nonsense. These men, though, experienced God on the mountain. And I want to suggest some reasons why this transfiguration, as we call it, happened. We see in verse 1, remember Jesus, two weeks ago we saw this, in chapter 8 of Mark's Gospel, was calling on his disciples to truly be disciples. Whoever comes after me, verse 34 of chapter 8, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There's a commitment involved in that's part of what we talked about as Cora was baptized today, her willingness to follow Jesus. And he's calling on all of us to follow the Savior, to obey the Savior. And he says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And he says, if you're ashamed of me in front of this generation, then I'll be ashamed of you when, we come, when the Son comes back in the glory of His Father with the holy angels. So He's alluding to the glory with which Jesus will someday come back. And what this actually is in chapter uh, 9 is a preview of the glory of Jesus' coming kingdom. He's going to pull the curtain back, as it were. And Jesus didn't walk around with a halo on his head. He used to have a television program called The Greatest Story Ever Told. And uh, the, the person that played the part of Jesus walked around and had a little halo that they imposed on his head. Of course, you can do that sort of thing with television and, you know, special effects. And there were movies that have done that sort of thing. But this is not one of those deals. Jesus looked like an ordinary person. Isaiah 53 bears that out. But he's just predicted that he's going to die. He's talked about the cost of discipleship. And maybe there's a question in the mind of the disciples. Was there any benefit to following Jesus, to being his disciple? Well, not only is he previewing the glory of the coming kingdom, he's also displaying his personal power. This is an incredible demonstration. And it's interesting that both Peter and John reflected on this in their writing. In John 8, 29, uh, we have Peter confirming, you are the Messiah. We've seen it. We know it. We've seen your glory. And in fact, later in 1 Peter, he's going to say, chapter 1, 2 Peter, chapter 1, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And John, in John chapter 1, verse 14, uh, said, we beheld His glory, chapter eight, 1, verse 18, we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, filled with grace and truth. Now we come to the transfiguration, which also helped to prepare them for His death, because you see, uh, they really don't have the idea that Jesus is going to die, even though He said that He was about to be put to death, that that's about to happen. Now, the normal way that we all experience God's kingdom is through death. Think about that. How do people get to heaven? They die. They don't buy a bus ticket. They don't buy a plane ticket. They don't get on one of those rockets that Elon Musk has made. Death is the doorway to heaven. I was thinking about Robbie this morning, and I know uh, Shirley has been thinking a lot about her, especially last week. Robbie was a dear lady who... Uh, was with us for many, many Sundays 
and now she's enjoying Sunday in heaven. And she has seen firsthand some of the glory of God's kingdom. And for some of us, none of us know when that day will come, when our death happens, we will be absent from this body, we will be present with the Lord. And these guys, these three men, Peter and James and John, are getting a little taste of what that's like. You like to get a little sample sometimes of something really good? My wife makes a mean seafood gumbo. And occasionally when she's making it, I'll slip in and get a taste. Just a little taste of it. These men are about to get a little taste. At this point, Mark gives us a very precise time reference. He says, now after six days. By the way, what happens after six days? What comes next? The seventh day. Isn't that interesting? God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, God rested. Seven is a number of completion, a number of perfection. God looked at everything He'd made, and behold, it was very good. Many of you have come to appreciate some of the great beauty of God's creation, the magnificence of it all. And these men are about to get a glimpse of how that relates to these men. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, led them up on a high mountain. Apparently this is Mount Hermon, which is about 9,200 feet, at least to the part where they were. It's the only real high mountain in that area, just north of the Lake of Galilee. They've been in Caesarea Philippi, and they go north from there. And Jesus takes these three men, and they're apart by themselves, and they're up on the mountain and walking around and climbed up there and all of a sudden he was transfigured before them the word is the word metamorphosis we get the, the greek word metamorphosis gives us that picture some of you remember from your high school biology what a metamorphosis is uh, a caterpillar spins a cocoon goes into that cocoon and within a short time or a matter of months, the caterpillar itself doesn't come out. A butterfly, a beautiful butterfly comes out. A transformation has taken place with incredible beauty. And the meaning of this word is that it's a change in appearance <clears throat> that conforms to the real essence. In other words, this is not a disguise. This is not some kind of a sleight of hand. This is not some kind of a Hollywood gimmick. Jesus literally was transformed right in front of their eyes. This happened. And verse 3 tells us, His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no wanderer on earth can whiten them. Now here in Texas, we don't see a lot of snow. Kathy and I were living in Nebraska and in Kansas City. We saw a lot of snow. When it first falls, there is nothing as white as snow. It is incredibly bright. And that's the picture here. And Mark has this great description. In fact, only Mark adds the note that no launderer on earth can get them this white. Some of you ladies have used bleach for years and other whiteners. You could not get things this white. And then he goes on to say, a couple of other guys showed up. Elijah appeared to them with Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. And the first question that I had, and you probably had that, how in the world did they recognize Elijah and Moses? Uh, they didn't have numbers on their back. You know, some Dallas cowboy has the number nine on his back, you think Tony Romo. Or number four, you think Dak Prescott. You know, you uh, know people by their number. But that's not the case here. My suspicion is that they were using each other's name. And uh, the Lord would say, uh, Moses, uh, so-and-so, or Elijah, so-and-so. And so they're listening to this conversation. And you say, why did Moses and Elijah come back? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is that Elijah never died. He was taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire. Moses, on the other hand, died, but God buried him on Mount Nebo. Nobody knew where he was buried. Nobody attended his funeral. So both of them passed off this earth in ways that are a little different. And I believe uh, there's a good likelihood that there are two witnesses in the book of Revelation, one of whom is probably Elijah. 
The other one, maybe most, could be Enoch, who was the other person in the Old Testament who was translated, did not see death. Could be Enoch and Elijah, could be Moses and Elijah. Could be two witnesses that we don't even know the names of them. But the bottom line is, uh, Jesus is going to talk about Elijah coming back for the restoration of all things. So here are these two men on the Mount of Transfiguration, talking with Jesus. Peter's over here, James is here, John is here. Their mouths are hanging open. Their eyes are bulging out. They are astounded at what's taking place. And again, keep in mind that Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. So you have a representation of the entire Old Testament here. Now, the next thing we see after the transformation of the appearance of Jesus and the two heavenly visitors is the traumatic response of Peter. Notice what Peter says. Verse 5, Peter answered, responded, we would say, and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. But Peter's a very positive person. He's not scared. He said, I'm glad we're here. Lord, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And maybe you're wondering, why did Peter say this? Well, the next verse has the answer. You always find the answer in the context. Because, verse 6, he did not know what to say. You ever been in that situation? You ever open your mouth and say something in response to a situation? And you realize when you said it, I don't know what I'm talking about. I have a clue. Peter didn't know what to say. And I believe me, if I had been there, if you had been there, we probably wouldn't have known what to say either. Now, Peter, and just don't condemn Peter for this, because I think what he's saying is, I'm really glad we're here, Lord. Let's see if we can keep this thing going, and we'll build some tabernacles. And remember, they had a seven-day feast of tabernacles where they built these booths out of the leaves and things and camped out in them, and they would do that once a year. That was part of their worship of the Lord. But that's not what Peter wanted to happen here. Uh, this is one of those situations. And I believe that it, there's one sense in which Peter's still trying to get around the cross. Remember, Jesus had said, the Son of Man's going to be crucified. And Peter said, no, Lord, you can't do that. And remember, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You don't understand the things of God. And I think Peter's still trying to duck that. He's thinking, boy, we got the kingdom right here and now. Let's keep this thing rolling. And then a voice from heaven, a cloud from heaven. Verse 7, this is the two-dimensional revelation from God the Father. And a cloud, by the way, the clouds were symbolized God's presence in the Old Testament. The thick cloud that covered Mount Sinai, there are a number of other instances as well. Cloud came and overshadowed them, so they couldn't see Jesus and the other disciple, the other uh, men, Moses and Elijah. Out of the cloud, a voice came. By the way, it's the same voice of God the Father that was heard at the baptism of Jesus. We had a baptism this morning. Jesus was baptized. When he was baptized, the voice from heaven said, "This is my beloved Son. Pay attention to him." And it was a dove symbolizing the Holy Spirit came down, sat on Jesus' shoulder. And here the voice simply says, This is my beloved Son. Keep listening to Him. In other words, in a tactful way, God is saying, Peter, shut up. <laughs> Peter, be quiet. Peter, listen. James chapter 1 reminds us that we have been given two ears and one mouth because we're to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. It's a good motto for living life. All right? This dramatic event suddenly is all over. And that's what happens with mountaintop experiences. They do come to an end. Oh, but what glory this was. And now... The only person left is Jesus. Verse 8, suddenly they looked around. They saw no one anymore but only Jesus and themselves. Wow. Now they're going to talk about the discussion of the transfiguration. Verse 9, as they came down from the mountain, first thing we have is a command from Jesus. 
a prohibition. He says, don't tell anybody about what you've seen. And he puts a time frame on it. Until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Huh? Risen from the dead? See, they still haven't figured this all out. The death and resurrection. We look back on this and we think, why didn't they get this? No, well, they didn't get it. But then Jesus is telling them, and they kept this word to themselves. They did what he said, but they were questioning what the rising from the dead meant. They still don't get it. But remember who the first two men at the tomb were? Peter and John. Remember John ran ahead and he was faster than Peter got to the tomb. Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. And he stopped outside, saw the tomb was open, saw the stone was rolled away. And Peter came along and he goes down inside. And then John follows him. And then the angel tells him, he's not here for he is risen. I always enjoy retelling the story of Kathy and me going down inside the garden tomb in Israel and seeing the words there on the back of the door that they have, He is not here, for He is risen. What a great reminder. Our Savior is alive. And they don't know that yet. They don't understand. And they have another question, verse 11. Why? By the way, why questions are pretty common, aren't they? We're going to see another why question a little later from the disciples. You ever have some of you have taught children in school? Some of you have raised children. And your children will ask you, why? Why this? Why that? Sometimes we as adults ask God, why? And these disciples, why does Elijah, why do the scribes say, verse 11, that Elijah must come first? Well, Jesus gives a twofold explanation. Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. But how it is written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. In other words, don't forget when you're asking about Elijah that my suffering is right around the corner. My death is about to happen. I'm about to be treated with contempt. But I say to you, here's the second part of the answer, that Elijah has also come. Huh? And the idea of who he's talking about here? John the Baptist. He has already come and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it was written of him. In fact, it's interesting, in Malachi chapter 4, the last book of the Bible, the last chapter of the Bible, Jesus is reinforcing here what Malachi wrote, that Elijah will come back and restore, be a part of restoring all things. John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, Scripture says. So, answers come. Now, how should we apply this mountaintop experience? A couple of things. First of all, we need to remember the manifestation of God's glory is right around the corner for us. We will be in the presence of the Lord and glorious things will be ours to experience forever and ever. This life is like a vapor. It appears a little while and vanishes away. A lot of people have vanished away during the coronavirus. A lot of deaths. The reality is death is appointed to every one of us. And ultimately, those of us who are believers go immediately into the presence of the Lord. And I believe that that will be the beginning of what will be just unbelievably wonderful. Glory in the presence of God. But there's a lesson here, too, about quiet waiting. Peter wasn't quiet. He didn't want to wait. He wanted to go to work. And sometimes God wants us just to wait quietly. Listen to what he has to say. And for Christ, as well as for us, suffering precedes glory. Maybe you're going through a hard time right now. Maybe you're going through some suffering. Some things are just not working out. And it's puzzling. And you've asked God, why? We've all been in that situation, haven't we? We've all asked God, why? Why is this happening to me? Why is this illness? Why is this conflict? Why is this challenge in my work, in my family, in my uh, personal health or whatever? And sometimes we go through the suffering and see God work it out. I've told the story many times lately about Beth Love. 
Rodney loves life. And Rodney shared his testimony a week ago, Saturday night on the radio, and talked about wondering why God allowed Beth first to get the COVID when she had been so healthy, then to wind up on a ventilator, and to spend more than 30 days hanging between life and death on a ventilator. I was with Rodney and Beth last week, and Beth is amazing. She looks better than me. Or she looked better than me anyway. <laughs> but I, I was amazed at how strong, how well she's doing. Now, there are others. Our friend Jerry Bostic still making a comeback. My friend Don Sekal still dealing with chemotherapy because of pancreatic cancer, going through some really tough times. And some of you have been through these kinds of things. Ken shared with us last week about his going through the testing and process. And so thankful for the good news there. And Misha had some test results that came back and we're thankful for that and others of us as well. But we go through hard times to get to the good times. And that brings us to the last part of this chapter. We'll cover this briefly. Experiencing God in the valley. They come down the mountain. They come to the disciples in verse 14. Jesus sees a great multitude. There are scribes there disputing with them. Now remember, this is up north. They come all the way from Jerusalem. And immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed. They ran to him and greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? He already knew the answer. But Jesus was good at asking questions. And he did. One of the crowd, not one of the teachers, not one of the scribes, said, Teacher, I brought my son. Has a mute spirit. He's demon-possessed. The spirit has made him, we would say, dumb or mute today. And he seizes him and throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes with his teeth. He becomes rigid. And I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, and they could not. Now, you may say, well, this sounds like epilepsy, and it does. But epilepsy has a biochemical component. This has a demonic or spiritual component. So keep that in mind. Sym symptoms are similar. And Jesus' response to this, they could not. Now, hang on, because back in chapter 6 and verse 7, Jesus had given his disciples authority to cast out demons. That was to be a part of their ministry. Why couldn't they? Well, Jesus is going to explain it in verse 19. Oh, faithless generation. Unbelieving generation. The disciples were not trusting Jesus for the power to deal with this problem. And the people around them were in the same boat. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you is literally the wording, the translation. You ever say that to your kids, parents? How long shall I put up with you? Usually until they're grown and gone. And Jesus, patient, says, bring him to me. They brought him. The demon caused him to convulse. He fell to the ground and wallowed and foamed at the mouth. And he asked his father, Jesus was compassionate. How long has this been happening? And he said from childhood, now we've seen the disciples' inability, their problem here. They can't do anything. Oftentimes he's thrown him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But notice this man. He's got a little faith here. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. I believe this man believed that Jesus could cast this demon out and restore his son. When he got there and the disciples couldn't, his faith was really tested. You ever had that happen? You were convinced that God was going to do something. And things didn't quite play out like you thought they were. Jesus up on the mountain, so he's not there. The disciples are working in the flesh instead of in the spirit, and they can't do anything. And things just don't work out. So the guy's faith is tested. But notice what Jesus says in verse 23. If you don't walk away with anything else today from this message, I hope you get this. Jesus said to him, verse 23, if you can, what? Believe. Say it again, if you can, believe. All things are possible. How many things? 
All, all things are possible to him who what? Believes. You get that? We need to repeat that. Three laws of learning, repetition, repetition, and you got the third one. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And what happened? Immediately the father of the child cried out and with tears he said, Lord, I believe. You know what else he said? Help my unbelief. I don't know about you, but I can sure relate to that guy. I can sure relate to what he's saying. You ever been in that situation? I'm trusting God. I'm believing God. Boy, I've got some questions. Boy, I'm just not sure. And Jesus said, well, I can't do anything for you. You've got to even now it's about No, Jesus didn't say that. In fact, when Jesus saw the people running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit. Jesus took the faith of this man and responded to it and cast out the demon. He said to a deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him, and furthermore, enter him no more. Don't come back. The spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, came out of him, and he became like one who was dead. So the many said, he's dead. Jesus, you killed this boy. Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and arose. Remember Jairus, the Roman centurion, his daughter? Similar kind of thing. We don't know that the boy was dead. He may have just been unconscious. But Jesus raised him up. And that shows the Savior's ability. We saw the disciples' inability. We saw the Savior's ability. And now we come to the concluding discussion. Verses 28 and 29. When he came into the house, the disciples asked him privately, Why? There's that why question again. Why could we not cast it out? After all, chapter 6, verse 7, he'd given them authority over unclean spirits. He said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer. And many of the early manuscripts add in fasting. Prayer takes us to Luke 18, 1, where Jesus said we're to always pray and never give up. Fasting takes us back to the Old Testament, to the book of Esther, where fasting was what they did. When Esther came to the kingdom for such a time as that and ultimately delivered the Jews from being wiped out well before the Holocaust. So it's amazing what the disciples are learning from Jesus. You see, they had been told to depend on the Lord. But instead of praying, they just kind of went about it and said, well, if Jesus told us we could do this, we're going to do it. And they found that they couldn't. And Jesus said in John 15 and verse 5, Apart from me, you can do very little. Right? Wrong. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's what he said. And that's exactly what the disciples are learning here. And for you and for me and the challenges of our lives, we can't do it apart from him. But even if we're like this man, if we say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, I guarantee you, we can see God answer prayer in dramatic ways. As we close today, three lessons. Number one, we experience God through prayer and through fasting. And I want to encourage you to be a person of prayer, a man of prayer, woman of prayer, a young person of prayer, an older person of prayer. All of us, people of prayer. Secondly, we're helpless apart from His indwelling and enabling power. Apart from Him, we just can't do it. Third, let's look for evidences of His hand in our lives. They may be big dramatic things like the Mount of Transfiguration. They may be down in the nitty gritty of life where we've got a child that's uh, like this demon-possessed child, really sick or in bad shape or some other kind of problem like that. It's kind of a mundane problem, but it's knocking the socks off of us. We don't know what to do. We can call on our God. And if you haven't trusted Him as Savior, that's the place to start. To admit you're a sinner, can't save yourself. By faith, place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us and rose again. 
That's what Cora was giving testimony to earlier today, that she had placed her trust for her salvation in Jesus Christ. And if you haven't done that yet, that's what you need to do today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It's living. It's powerful. Thank you for this mountaintop experience that we've seen, this opportunity to explore this portion of your word. And Lord, my prayer is that you would make the word a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For Jesus' sake, amen. Stand together and sing, Just As I Am. We have two stanzas in the insert, our closing hymn. be with you. And with you also.